I remember one of my test pilot friends was, was really feeling sick, but did not want to go to the doctor because he didn't want to be grounded. He finally couldn't take it. He collapsed on the way to the doctor's office. This is not a good idea, kids. If you're sick, go see the doctor. I'm Mike Massimino, and this is how health is different in space. I was an astronaut for 18 years. I flew in space two times, two missions on the space shuttle. Health is really important for astronauts. There are a whole list of things that can have you become disqualified from going to space. Typically, you want to try to be as healthy as you can. And you want to have a healthy heart. You want to be as fit as you possibly can. You want to eat right and take care of yourself. And if you don't and you fall out of the standards that you're supposed to be within, it could mean you're not going to get a chance to fly in space. You don't have to be an Olympic athlete, but they want to make sure that you're healthy enough to do the job, which means they don't want to be worried about a medical situation when you're in space. If you have a propensity toward kidney stones, for example, that was a disqualifying thing. They don't want you having a kidney stone develop while you're in space. The medical situation on Earth is bad enough, but in space it's really bad. So they want to make sure that people they're putting into space are not going to have a problem once they're in space. Exercise is important for all of us. Before I became an astronaut, I generally did sports for recreation. You know, riding my bike for fun or maybe going for a run, things like that. Once I became an astronaut, it, it became a little more structured. I felt like I was, was getting ready for somewhat of an athletic event because spacewalking did require exertion and you needed it to move around almost constantly and you had to manipulate the suit that you were wearing. So the better shape you could be in, the better off you were going to perform. I was in the best physical shape of my life before each one of my space flights. And that was, I was older. I was 39 on my first flight and then 46 on my second flight. But I was in better shape than I ever was as a high school athlete or any other time in my life. Exercise in space is a little bit different. Because you're in zero gravity, you're floating. So it's, it's as if you're on bed rest, but even worse than that as far as physical conditioning goes. You're laying around, you're not exerting yourself, you're just floating around. And even doing things like just walking or even sitting on Earth, you're fighting against gravity. In space, you're floating the whole time, so it's no load on your bones or on your muscles. And if you don't exercise in space for a, a prolonged period of time, you can lose uh, bone mass and you can lose muscle mass and your heart, is, which is a muscle, it'll shrink and that's not a good thing. So the way we prevent these bad things from happening is by exercising. Weights aren't gonna work very well in space. You can take an object that weighs 600 pounds and pick it up with one finger because everything's floating, it's weightless. So you wanna be pulling against something for a resistive exercise workout, like a spring or something that has some resistance to it, because that works just fine in space, but actual weights won't. There is a two-hour exercise period set up six days a week for astronauts who are on the space station. And it's a combination of cardio, which is riding an exercise bike or a treadmill. The CVIS, the bike, cycle ergometer vibration isolation system. The vibration isolation part of it is pretty important. Because when you're working out, you're going to cause vibration. And the advantage that you have on a space station for science is that you're in zero gravity. And if you start shaking, if vibrating, that compromises the microgravity environment. You're gonna disturb the experiments that are using the, the microgravity, the zero gravity environment for the science. But start shaking it up a little bit and you're gonna hear about it. So these engineers who have developed these machines uh, probably don't get as much credit as they deserve because they're not only keeping astronauts healthy, but they're isolating the vibrations associated with doing that sort of workout to those machines and not spreading it around to compromise the integrity of the zero gravity experiments on board. But that's the way you can get cardio exercise in space. For resistive exercise, advanced resistive exercise device, ARED, which is a pretty high tech piece of equipment that works on pulleys and springs and, and you can do a variety of exercises with that. You can even do squats, you can do leg presses, you can do curls, you can do bench press. And so combining that with the cardio devices, you get a pretty good workout. 
We also had TheraBands, these elastic bands that, that we would use to give you some resistance. And we have astronauts coming back in sometimes better shape than they were when they left. The way we prevent sickness in space is by putting you, the astronaut, into a quarantine ahead of time so you're not bringing germs to space. The spacecraft should be perfectly clean. There's, um, there should not be bacteria in the spacecraft. So what we do is we enter a quarantine period about a week before the flight and you're what we call it as health stabilization. The only people that are allowed to be around you have to be screened and approved by the flight surgeon. There was an age limit that changed for kids to be around you. My first flight, my children were too young to be near me. My second flight, they were both teenagers, so they were able to come visit me. Food poisoning is probably not gonna be happening because that's all controlled of what goes on board. Your water is clean water. Uh, if, I think we could treat it as well with iodine uh, if needed. You know, iodine leaves a certain taste, so there was a Another filtration system, we had to remove the iodine out of the water. So they really want to make sure your water was clean. So you're in a pretty much a germ-free environment. On Earth, when you're not feeling well, you can go to the doctor. You know, somebody try, might take care of it yourself in some ways, some medicine or aspirin or whatever you have available to you. But eventually, if you're feeling sick, you can you can go to the doctor and get checked. When you apply to be an astronaut, if you, if you get far enough along in the selection process that you're a finalist, and typically there's uh, about 100, 120 finalists for each astronaut class, and then they'll pick however many they need. Your selection interview is not just an interview, but it's also a lot of medical exams. And you get checked out pretty much from top to bottom. It's a really extensive medical exam that you go through that takes a few days. Uh, and they'll check you out and, and make sure that you're, you're healthy. I still go for an annual physical every year as part of like a, a long range health data collection that NASA does. But in space, your medical care is a little bit different. We had a full set of uh, medicine in our medical kit for just about every kind of ailment imaginable. And we had to make sure we didn't have any allergic reactions to those medicines. So we got a drug testing kit. We were supposed to take one of these. They would tell you how many you're supposed to take. And every day, pretty much, we tested something different, whether it's an antibiotic or a sleep medicine or a painkiller or whatever it was. We always had someone who was our main medical officer on the flight. Uh, sometimes that was a doctor. I never flew with an MD. I did fly with a, vet uh, a veterinarian, and he became a medical doctor. But someone needs to work on that person as well. So they have another person who is kind of like the assistant. So you always have at least two or sometimes three people who are trained to be medical officers. We get CPR training. We get for basic first aid. So we can help each other that way. But some of us get the more extensive medical officer training, which is kind of like the equivalent to being an EMT. You also are in close contact with the flight surgeon. So flight surgeons are medical doctors who have this special certification that allows them to deal with aviation, space, medical issues. Our flight surgeon is also aware of things that can happen in zero gravity and the ill effects of zero gravity when bone loss and muscle loss and other issues that might arise because of the spacesuit, causing of injuries and so on for the, the job we have. So if you have a problem in space, there is a first aid kit, there's a medical kit that you can do basic things with. You can do things like suture up a cut if needed. Surgery is a bit of a problem. I, I, I think at first in the space station program, they thought that they would be able to do surgeries. It really is not practical to be able to do any major invasive operation. If someone needed something like that, they would deorbit them and bring them home. It's easier to do that, take care of that on Earth. That's not going to be the case when we go further away from the planet. We're going to be have to, you can't fly people back from Mars that easily. You're going to have to be able to deal with things uh, en, en route or once you get to that new place. So right now, the luxury of being close to the ground helps with a lot of major medical ailments. We've never had anything that we've had to do that for. We've never had to deorbit for a medical issue. If you need help from the ground on the space station or on the space shuttle, we were able to call the ground and, and see if there was, a, there was help. Motion sickness happens to most people. It happened to me. My first day in space, I, I didn't feel very well. It's a, it's a conflict between 
our vestibular system and our eyesight. That conflict can lead to a little bit of stomach awareness. You're moving around the cabin, let's say, with your eyes, but your inner ear is telling you you're perfectly still and uh, it does not feel good. I was not used to it my first day in space, of course, and I ended up throwing up at the end of the day. And the next day I was fine, and on my second flight I was fine. Your brain doesn't know what, what it, what's going on at first, and it reacts a certain way, but then it learns and you don't have a problem. So it's an adaptation as opposed to a real sickness. How do you throw up if you get sick in space? Oh, the sun's starting to come up. Um, so here's an astronaut barf bag right here. Puking works just like it does on Earth in that stuff will come out of your mouth, right, from your stomach like a projectile. Now, uh, the difference is that if you do that on Earth, it's probably going to land somewhere. In space, it's, it's going to come out and float around which is not a good situation. It'll get everybody sick. So uh, we want to use our vomit bag. We have really good vomit bags. Emesis bags is what they call them. I guess emesis is a fancy word for vomit. You would vomit into those, and it, they're really well made. They're cloth on the outside, plastic on the inside. Get your nail. So everything will go inside of this bag. And then uh, once you're done, you can seal it off roll it up, compact it, and then get another one ready. I was very concerned about this on my first flight. Uh, I had two on me all the time that, that first day. My, after the first day, I was fine. I didn't need one. But you want them handy when you first get to space. I think in everyday life, we realize the importance of mental health and trying to keep ourselves mentally healthy. And NASA is the same way. So there was always help available if you needed to speak to someone about whatever uh, issue you might be having, uh, and they were very open to that. It was just like anything else. If you had a, uh, if you were sick, you went to go see the doctor, and if you weren't feeling well and, and, and felt like you needed to speak to a mental health professional, that was available for you as well. And uh, you were expected to go see one if you weren't feeling well. So if you just remember those two exercises and keep your breathing pace, you should be okay on this test. So they were very open to that, and it was very important. And uh, and I appreciated that, I think most of us did. In space, I think what NASA has realized over the years, in particular for long duration flights or even short flights, there could be some extra mental stressors put on the astronauts. It could be stressful, uh, you're worried about your, your physical well-being, so there's stress associated with that. Also performance of your job, you, know, you wanna do a good job and you might feel the pressure that way too. Also you're away from home, uh, you might not get as much sleep as you like. It's a new environment. Uh, there may be family issues happening. All these things might be happening that could also affect your performance. We have a whole program associated with what we call psychological support. And psychological support is there to help astronauts feel good. And that all involves uh, contact with home. So we have email. We have a capability of, of calling our, our family and friends from space through an internet protocol phone. The possibility to Skype with your family is there as well. Keeping in contact with Earth is really important for psychological support. It's not just being nice, but it's also to for performance. A happy crew member is a productive crew member. What I've seen come, though, sometimes is that a, an event happens on Earth. We had a crew on board space station when we had uh, the Columbia accident and uh, we needed to get the word up to those guys that we had this accident and and the crew was lost and the accident was a time where mental health was really stressed in fact it was required that all of us go check in with the psychiatrist when a traumatic event like that happens like a loss of life bad news happened on earth for directly affecting the personal life of the crew member in space that's when you sometimes need some psychological support right so I think that comes in different forms. Sometimes it's, it's a crew member, a good friend, a member of the clergy, a spouse, a brother, whoever, they try to get that person on the phone. So then your flight is over and you return to Earth. So once you come back and you land, the biggest difference that you'll notice is gravity has kicked back in. Those changes to your body that occurred because you went to zero gravity, and some of those are physical changes, they revert back to the way it was when gravity is encountered again. 
So some of the physical changes, for example, is in space, our spine grows a bit because it, our spine is held into place by gravity to some extent, and in zero gravity, the spine elongates. So my spacewalking suit was actually sized an inch and a half higher in the waist to accommodate spinal growth than what I would, the space I would wear when I practiced uh, in the pool for my spacewalks. So you get a little bit of discomfort in the back when that happens in space. You feel it, a um, little back pain, but then it goes away. When you come back to Earth, your spine is settling again immediately. So you have to be really careful. No abrupt movements with your head. We've had some astronauts hurt their backs, particularly in their neck, by doing something in quick motion or something like this before things have settled can, can hurt themselves. Um, you're not supposed to pick up anything. Your kids are usually the, the biggest hazard because you want to hold them and pick them up. If they're a baby, it's not a problem. If they're a teenager, they're too big to do that. But you know, somewhere in between, you, know, you want to be careful with that. So lifting things uh, as soon as you get back are an issue because you want your spine to kind of settle where it's supposed to. And the other thing that is a physical change is the fluid in your body in, in space when you're in zero gravity tends to pool in your upper extremities. What that could mean is when you get back to Earth and gravity sets in and the fluid redistributes, you could get lightheaded, your blood pressure could go down, you could pass out. So one of the things we do to help prevent against that before we enter, we go through fluid loading, where before you enter, we have lots of drink bags and there's a prescription you get based on your body weight of what you're supposed to drink. It could be salt tablets with water or there's chicken consomme or there was this thing we called AstroAid, which was kind of like a, not really Gatorade, but, but you had to drink a lot to try to get those bodily fluids there so that when you got back to one gravity, you didn't have this bigger orthostatic problem when you tried to stand up. Bigger issue, maybe, or the thing that's more prominent is the what's going on in your head. Because now gravity is there again, and that vestibular system that was silent uh, for all those days or however long you were in space is now excited again, and it's getting input like crazy, and the brain's saying, what the, what the heck is this? What's going on here? You want to move slowly. I felt like I needed to walk with my legs wide apart because I felt like I was going to fall over to keep my balance. I didn't want to turn my head very much to excite the, my vestibular system as much. And after a couple of days, you're, you're fine. But you're instructed not to drive a car or fly an airplane or lift anything heavy or do anything like that until you're approved for those activities by the flight surgeon. Uh, final farewells and handshakes uh, all the way around uh, before they make their way uh, through that hatchway behind peak into the Soyuz TMA-19M spacecraft. One of our uh, biggest concerns for astronaut health in space is radiation exposure. Uh, we have to be careful about that here on Earth as well. When we're out in the sun, we want to wear a sunscreen to protect us from the harmful effects of, of the sun. In space, uh, we don't have an atmosphere or a magnetic field, which also protects us from radiation here on Earth. If you're above that, uh, you're going to be exposed, and that we're very concerned with. So we try to do whatever we can to shield the astronauts from radiation. And we do that uh, in the spacecraft, for, by, for example, by using certain materials and shielding that will protect them from radiation. NASA does uh, monitor that. We have a device called the dosimeter, which is a, more or less looks like a piece of plastic that can measure the amount of radiation you have taken. And it's placed in your in your launch suit, and then you hand that in at the end of the mission and they read it to see how much radiation you've been exposed to. As we go further and further away, we get further from Earth, radiation exposure could be the most important issue that needs to be solved or prevented against if we're going to be traveling further and further into space. Something we don't always think about. Radiation exposure is, is, uh, it can be very harmful and it's a real challenge for space travel. One thing to remember is you want to enter your space flight in as best shape as possible. It's hard to make up for a lack of exercise while you're in space, but it is much easier to be able to maintain where you are and maybe get a little better if you enter the flight, if you launch in pretty good physical condition. For now, the best way to stay healthy in a zero gravity environment is to exercise.